Welcome, welcome. This is Britt Babcock. I'm the president of Avanti International. And welcome to all of our attendees to our webinar on buying back capacity, rehabilitation of existing sewer systems to maximize cost effectiveness of public utilities. I really appreciate everyone's attendance today. We are uh, always eager to, to share our knowledge and uh, look forward to educating and providing those opportunities to expand your knowledge and appreciate your willingness to participate with this uh, with us today. We are uh, very much aware of everything that's going on in the world and we know that, that things are a bit hectic out there and, and we you know I'd like to begin before we get started just that uh, we're grateful that everyone's being safe and healthy and we hope that everyone on the call and your your family and your friends and uh, your workers and coworkers are all all healthy and safe. So thank you for taking the time with us today to learn more about your municipal collection systems and how we can buy back that capacity. With us today, uh, obviously myself, but uh, your presenters are gonna be Mr. Chris Hamilton. He is our Southeast Regional Manager for Avanti. Chris has been with Avanti a little over four years. And uh, he is actually five, sorry, six years. Sorry, Chris, six years. And uh, Chris has got uh, 14 years of experience in the grouting industry, so highly knowledgeable, very capable. Also with us is Mr. Jacob Swanson. He's our Midwest Regional Manager. Jake has been with us for four years, and uh, he too is at the 14-year mark with his experience in grouting, both in industrial and geotechnical uh, applications, and now in municipal as well. Chris shares that same resume uh, across those different facets of grouting as well. Uh, I myself will be also moderating and presenting uh, a little bit today, and we have uh, I've got over 25 years of experience in construction industry, uh, a little more than 10 in grouting in my time tenure with Avanti, and uh, uh, practiced engineering for a few years as well myself uh, before jumping into technical sales and, and being a part of the Avanti family. So I'm grateful to be here. One of the things we're going to do throughout the presentation is we'd like to ask a few poll questions just to help gauge your knowledge base, and it'll help us uh, help us help you. So one of the first things we're going to do is is poll you on this question. The question is, based on your current beliefs, which trenchless technology would you engage to control I and I? Please select one of the following: CIPP, grouting, combination of both CIPP and grouting, or neither of the other technologies. We'll take a few minutes now to let everybody respond to that. Uh, once we're done responding, we'll actually take a, take a moment to look at the results. Give it just a few more moments now. All right, uh, fantastic. Um, love that response. Uh, meaning that uh, there's there's definitely a lot of knowledge base out there, and it's a combination of uh, both CIPP and grouting. They really are a hand in glove fit for controlling I and I. Um, looks like some of it is out there is just grouting, and some just CIPP at seven percent and twelve percent. But seventy nine percent are a combination of both CIPP and grouting, and uh, we are a firm believer that there is not a competition in place between the two. But they definitely complement each other in the in the industry. So I will pass it on now to Mr. Chris Hamilton. Chris, welcome. Thank you, Britt. Um, so the uh, and hopefully everybody can see the screen. Um, the spirit of this presentation that we're going to give today is is uh, exactly what the title page suggests, and that is capitalizing on your existing infrastructure and what we mean by that is that when you you come to a fork in the road as whether you're a utility owner, a utility engineer, you have to make a decision to either expand your system or to capitalize on what you have and rehab the existing system. Um, and so uh, why would we go down the road of rehab as opposed to expansion? And the, the answer is typically about cost. So uh, as we are 
Uh, Britt, if you could give control back to me. So it's just left cloud, left mouse click, and it should give it to you. You should have it. All right. A little bit of a delay. Bear with us, folks. Chris, just there continue speaking about the slide, yeah. and we'll get your comment. Yeah, I think, I think it just got, uh, I think it just got connected. No, somebody else has got the, uh, somebody else has got control of the screen. Well, anyway, so the spirit of the the presentation we're going to try to give you today is just about focusing on the existing infrastructure you have and rehabbing that, as opposed to building new infrastructure. And like I mentioned a bit ago, that's predominantly driven by cost. So uh, one of the things that we're going to go through is we're going to talk about very briefly um, some of the projects that have been launched recently. I say recently within the past five years. So the first one is, uh, if you look on the left side of your screen, the EPA to loan a record $1.6 billion to a wastewater expansion project. That was uh, from 2015. It is for a project in Sacramento County, $1.6 billion. Next is on the right side, sewer capacity issues put a county construction on hold. Um, this is from Portland, and essentially that was a $55 million sewer expansion project. And if uh, I'm sure many of you follow these types of projects, you see them in the news, Trenchless Technology, and all that kind of thing, you know that $55 million is actually on the low side of the price tag of some of these types of projects. But one that I've, I've taken this really big interest in is. Uh, Martinsburg, West Virginia. And again, this is from 2015, 2016, but the metrics I really want you to, to be clear on. So an expansion and upgrade of their existing wastewater treatment plant was completed in late 2015 to early 2016. This project had a total cost of $53 million. The capacity of the plant, again, capacity is a key word here, increased from 2.5 million gallons per day up to 12 million gallons per day during storm events. Their utilities director was quoted as saying that their system would spike as much as eight or nine million gallons in a few hours during storm events. So capacity became an issue, as you can imagine, and that's what led them down the path of, of this expansion project. The caveat to all of this $53 million, only around 40% of that project was funded by the feds. So why does that matter? Um, of that $53 million price tag for this project, $29 million was to be absorbed by the local utility, which, as many of you know and can understand, had no choice but to pass that on to their customer base of 6,000 users. I'll say that again, $29 million passed on to 6,000 users. That doesn't make you very popular in town when you work for the utility. If we were talking about a an Atlanta or a Charlotte, North Carolina, or an LA, that would be a very different situation. But $29 million fell on 6,000 users. So why, uh, why do systems, utilities, decide that they need to expand or, or otherwise construct new infrastructure? Well, there are four driving factors. There's population growth. Uh, land development, commerce, increased efficiency and profit to the utility, and then, of course, aging and deteriorating infrastructure, which is kind of what we see the most. Um, population growth. Every year in the United States, we grow by about 0.7 to 0.75 percent. And you may look at that and you go, well, it's really not that much. But what that equates to is about 2 million people every year, population growth in the United States alone. That's significant. Next is land development and commerce. Well, if uh, you're a city of Athens, Georgia, and say uh, an Amazon or you know a large production facility wants to open a new business in your county or in your city, of course, as they do, you're going to have to build new infrastructure to support that. So that's another factor. Next is increased efficiency of new infrastructure. If you're in utility uh, management or your utility owner and engineer, you know that there's always 
uh, you know, something that's the latest and greatest. It could be filter media, it could be uh, flocculation design, it could be all kinds of things, right? Um, so that's one thing that causes utilities, municipalities to expand or or upgrade their infrastructure. And then there's deteriorating infrastructure, aging and deteriorating. Like anything else, um, no matter what pipe composition we're talking about or manhole composition, be it precast, or RCP pipe, or HTP, everything has a life expectancy or a lifespan. And so as uh, that infrastructure meets its lifespan, its effective lifespan, then it's going to begin to deteriorate. And that's what drives a lot of util uh, municipalities and utilities to either expand or rehab. So with that opening, I'm going to kick it back to Mr. Britt Babcock for our second poll question. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Great information. We are, to all our attendees, going to jump into our second poll question here now. How common are sinkholes and depressions in your community? Uh, please select one of the four choices up on the board there. Never, rarely, sometimes, or very common. We'll give it about a minute here for everybody to respond. Appreciate everybody taking the time to do this. It's always interesting and, and fun to get this information. And again, we'll look at the results here once we close this. So we'll give a few more seconds here, let everybody a chance to respond. <clears throat> all right, all right, all right. So to answer that question, um, based on our attendees on this call today, how common are sinkholes and depressions in your community? It uh, looks like sometimes, which is what we would expect, that uh, it definitely, uh, the occurrence of sinkholes from the pike being of fines and soils into defects within the sanitary sewer collection system uh, can happen. It's, uh, it definitely is a common occurrence. So that's the answer we would expect at 47%, rarely 35%, so forth and so on. So um, thank you everyone for responding to that poll question. Next up is Mr. Jake Swanson, and he's going to talk to you about I and I infiltration and inflow. Jake, you have the floor. All right, thank you, Britt. It's always interesting to see how those uh, questions, those polls come back, especially one that uh, talks about depressions or sinkholes. It's not something that we always take into consideration, but uh, it is one of the uh, symptoms of I and I in our below grade infrastructure or in our collection systems. We've already heard I and I a couple of times, and this is likely uh, going to be a refresher, but defining what I and I is is oftentimes important for uh, all of the attendees. Some of them might just be reinforcing, others it might be something new. We've got a pretty wide variety of people on the call. So with that said, inflow is defined as being surface water which enters our collection system, typically through illicit connections. That might be gutters and downspouts that are connected to the sewer system or sump pumps or faulty or failing manhole lids and covers, where infiltration is going to be groundwater which is entering the collection system via failed pipe joints, manhole structures that have leaking barrel joints or pipe penetrations that have failed, perhaps a gasket, um, or at our service connections. Our connections are taps that are going into businesses and private residences. Just something to uh, kind of take into consideration and keep in the back of our minds of how inflow and infiltration is uh, defined and designated as we move through the presentation. When we look at the uh, process of failure within the system and we really focus in on that I and I, we have two paths that uh, a flow chart will show us. Down the right hand side, you can see this is going to be more specific to the actual flow or the volumes that we're seeing at the treatment plant. Overall, this is going to reduce the utilities uh, overall capital because they're treating more. So oftentimes they wind up having to hike their rates to the end user or the customers. Additionally, rain events greatly increase their flows and can result in uh, more frequent SSOs or sanitary sewer overflows. Um, additionally, that winds up leading down where we don't want to go into uh, fines and our consent decrees. Down the left side, you see loss of fines. What in the world is that? I'm not going to spend too much time on the chart because we're going to go into more information on the upcoming slides. So loss of fines is actually a soil condition similar to erosion where the groundwater that's flowing and infiltrating into the collection system is actually drawing those soils 
with it. So it can be silts, it can be clays, or in the event that the defect is large enough, you can start pulling in sand particles or other. As you can see in the picture, this is a vitrified clay pipe. You can see some offset in those joints. We have a lot of sediment in the bottom of the pipe, reducing the capacity by about 50%. That's something that we want to take into consideration. That loss of fines, <laughs> excuse me, is going to have a few different uh, symptoms or problems that it causes for our collection system. We're reducing the capacity, as shown in the previous picture. Those soils are actually lost from the exterior. So these are supporting soils that maintain the structural integrity of that piping or the collection system. Also, when we lose soils, those soils become weaker on the outside. Over time, they're going to compact, causing subsidence or settlement of any neighboring infrastructure. That can be your streets, your sidewalks, it could be a utility vault, an electrical vault, it could be a uh, water main. We'll see a couple examples of where these symptoms or results from infiltration and loss of soils and loss of fines come into play as we move in to the next slides. So in the picture here, you can see a road depression. This is right next to a stormwater catch basin. It's very common. We see this frequently. And this is where we were bringing up earlier surface indications. At the surface, if we see cracking, settlement, any type of subsidence, oftentimes that's going to give us a good indication of where a failure is or what is going on with our blow grade system. If soils are being lost, we'll wind up with impressions like this. And over time, if not treated, they can result in larger issues. This one's kind of near and dear to me, not too far from uh, where I grew up. This is in Duluth, Minnesota, after a record rainfall. Next slide. This is Houston, Texas, only a few miles away from Avanti's headquarters. And if you see uh, a couple common situations in each one of these, you'll note that the root cause to each one of these sinkholes, including this one in Pennsylvania, or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, was below ground infrastructure. This one with the bus is kind of unique in Pittsburgh because they say that this was from a broken water main. However, they actually attributed much of this to one of the sewer lines that was next to it where they knew that they had done cleaning and it was likely due to the loss of fines and some of the subsidence and settlement, which could have potentially resulted in that water main not being supported properly. When we look at rehabilitating some of these systems, the most common repair methods that we see, one, is do nothing. Not as common anymore. Thankfully, we're seeing a lot more emphasis put on our collection systems. We're doing more uh, than ever. So that's not as common anymore. Dig and replace. We see this more in rural areas where it's still uh, relatively economical. Disruption isn't as big of a consideration as in urban areas. But generally, in an urban area, it's going to be high cost and too disruptive. So we're going to try to look at trenchless means. That's where we come into CIPP or cast in place pipe. As Bert mentioned earlier in our uh, poll showed, it appears that everybody is pretty familiar with CIPP, one of the most utilized structural repairs. Great technology, comes at a moderate cost uh, and, and a medium disruption as well, but it is that structural fix. Additionally, we have short liners and point repairs when there's just a segment of that line that has a structural deficiency. These are moderate cost, low disruption, pretty quick and easy to do, also structural. The nice thing about that CIPP liner is you wind up with a brand new pipe inside of a pipe. There's no more joints, but you have to restore the connection, the service connection going to your private residences and businesses. At that point, once that's restored, that is the new point for infiltration or loss of soils, loss of fines, start entering the system. That's where top hats and T-liners potentially can come in if there are structural deficiencies there as well. Unique thing about all of these that we just covered, is they're all structural repairs. They're also higher cost. When we look at injection grouting, it's the only trenchless technology specifically designed and developed for treating infiltration. That's its sole, sole purpose. 
it's not structural. However, if you do not require a structural repair and infiltration is your only consideration, this is gonna be a way to stretch your budget so that you can utilize these other repair methods in other areas, stretching the municipality's budget, trying to get more of that system addressed. Mainline and lateral grouting, we're gonna take a little bit just to focus on these. This is a unique kind of picture, but you can see that green ring is actually one of the joints that was grouted with the packer that's in the center here. It's kind of a fun picture. Helps tell the story similar to this one. A holistic approach, meaning that we want to address every portion of the system. Manholes, laterals, main lines. If we really want to kick I and I out of the system, we have to address each component of that system. When we look at mainline grouting, this is what it actually looks like in the pipe. If we were able to cut it and show it, this is the best way with an animation. We have a CCTV camera set up so we can see where this uh, device called a mainline packer is slid into place, straddles the joint. The two yellow bands are actually infl or inflatable bladders. They can inflate those, isolate that joint, perform an air pressure test. If that air pressure drops off, they know that the joint has failed. They perform grouting or they start pumping grout. It fills that annual space that the packer has created, pressurizes, and then that grout flows out into the soils, turns to a solid that water no longer can pass through, stabilizing the soils. Then they would perform another air pressure test, confirming that the joint has been properly sealed, moving on to the next joint. Similar to mainline joints, there's a lateral connection grouting. This is similar to mainline, except for we have the addition of one bladder that is inflated and extends up the lateral. This can go most commonly three to five feet, but has gone as far as 30 feet up the lateral from the main. Same uh, situation with the air testing. They can perform air testing if necessary, perform grouting, and then confirm that it has been sealed afterwards with another air test. Pretty unique, interesting technology. With that, I'm gonna pass it back. All right, thank you, Jake. Yeah, grouting is definitely a great method to buy back capacity in your, in your systems to stop those loss of fines and they can clog up your systems. Um, we're on to our third poll, so, poll question now. Uh, and that question is, what is your biggest contributor to I&I? &I? Uh, if the attendees could please select one of the following four answers, main lines, laterals, manholes, or D, all the above. Obviously, there's not a D there, but you guys can see that the last question is all the above. Uh, take a few seconds here to let everybody answer that question. So we've, we've spoken about and, and talked about main lines and lateral grouting now we've showed that uh, next topic will be up will be manholes by mr chris hamilton we'll take a few more seconds to let everybody answer what is your biggest contributor to i and i main lines laterals manholes or all of the above just a little bit longer there we go all right um poll results so all of the above at 60 percent was our biggest answer uh, interesting, main, manholes and laterals were at 17% and then main lines at 6%. So uh, great response there. Uh, biggest contributors, yeah, they all are contributing factors, right? They definitely all are. I'd like to welcome back Mr. Chris Hamilton now. Chris was gonna talk to you about manhole grouting. Like, uh, like I said, we've captured the main lines and laterals and how those are, uh, can be approached from a grouting perspective to buy back that capacity. Uh, the last component to do a holistic repair now is manholes. Mr. Chris, take it away, please. Thank you, sir. So one of the slides that Jake went through just a moment ago said holistic approach, and, and he's absolutely right. Um, when you are addressing infiltration and trying to reduce infiltration and increase capacity in your system, in many cases, I'd say most cases, you have to look at the system holistically, that being manholes, mainline joints, lateral connections. Um, so what I'm going to focus on going forward is manholes. Jake talked to you about mainline joint grouting, lateral connection grouting. Um, I'm going to talk to you about manholes. We, in, in our industry, we kind of, 
uh, jokingly or lightheartedly say that manholes are the low-hanging fruit of infiltration because the type of equipment that you need to seal leaks or to eliminate infiltration in manholes is very low cost. It's very simple. Most utilities already have the equipment for confined space entry. So really what we're saying by the low hanging fruit is that manholes are very accessible. Um, so one of the techniques that we talk about is called curtain grouting. You may have heard it called encapsulation grouting. Um, but essentially what this is for, it can be used on brick or precast manholes, uh, new or old, doesn't really matter. But it's a process by which when you have a large network of defects in a manhole, let's say you pop the lid and let's say it's a brick manhole and you've got 30 feet of mortar joint that uh, is actively leaking, you know that point repair is probably not going to be very efficient. So in that case, you would just encapsulate the manhole. Same thing with a precast manhole. Sometimes you, know, you have precast barrel joints that are um, damaged, maybe in transit, maybe during placement. They have a network of cracks or they have significant issues. And sometimes encapsulation or curtain grouting is the right way to go. Um, what does urethane grouting look like? Well, with manholes, typically we recommend using urethane injection resins as opposed to acrylates or cement based. Um, or epoxy based injection resins. And so, what does urethane injection grouting look like? Well, it's a very complex process now. And you, this is a part of the presentation where you really want to take notes because there's a lot to see. So, this is a picture of a technician doing some injection work on a failing water stop in a BNR basin. Um, and as I mentioned, now you can see it's a very high, uh, very complex process. He's got a small paint pump, uh, a few buckets. Uh, a pail of our resin, a hand tool, and a broom. Very complex stuff we're looking at. But the main thing that I want you to see is that what he's doing right there in this picture is he's injecting an injection port with one of our low viscosity urethane resins. And what you see on the outfall pipe is actually grout that's traveling from where he's injecting five to six feet away. And what's happening is it's sealing everything in between the technician who's injecting and the point of exfiltration. So uh, that's day one. This is also day one after the project was completely finished. And also on day one, after a few minutes of cleanup, that's the end result of the project. So uh, we, we've seen what grouting looks like in the main line and lateral connections now in manholes and tanks. But we, it's really important to identify and define what grouting is, what grouting is not. Um, grouting is, as Jake mentioned earlier, it's the only technology that was designed specifically for eliminating infiltration, sealing leaks. Uh, it is the most cost effective of all the torrential technologies presently. And it's the only technology that has a 50 year design life at a 12% concentration. All right, that's a big deal, a 50 year design life, because most of your infrastructure has a 50 year or less lifespan. Things injection grouting is not. It's not a structural remedy. As Jake mentioned earlier, all of your lining technology, CIPP, point repairs, um, top hats and T liners, all great tools to have in your toolbox, but they are structural repairs that are not designed for infiltration. Injection grouting is the opposite. It's not a structural remedy, but it is designed for infiltration. Um, Injection grouts have never been banned in the United States, and they, contrary to popular belief, yes, in geotechnical settings for like soil stabilization, they do solidify soils, but they are not any more difficult to excavate after injection. So where are injection grouts used? Well, we've obviously covered the sewer system its entirety, but there's so many places where utilities and contractors are using injection grouts right now beyond the sanitary sewer system. So for instance, your storm sewer system, culverts, tunnels, earth and concrete dams, soil stabilization, uh, slab lifting, pump stations, lift stations. Uh, there, there's just a number of different uh, applications where water infiltration is a problem and grouting can bring solution to that issue. Culverts and tunnels, just going to do a run through what we just talked about.
And actually, I'm going to pause right here because one thing that we're starting to see a lot of growth in of uh, recent has been parking decks and telecom vaults. That's why these two are grouped together. Um, as you can imagine, if you're a telecom, for instance, you're an AT&T technician or something, you go into a telecom vault, you've got all kinds of cables, buried cables. Water can be an issue. If you're, if you're in the vault and you're trying to pull cable or service a line, water can be an issue. Same thing with parking decks. You know, uh, most parking decks we think about three, four, five levels high above ground. But if you think about it, most parking decks also have at least one to two, sometimes three or four levels below ground as well, just to maximize vertical space. So infiltration is often an issue in both of those settings. So with that, we'll go to the fourth poll question, and I'll hand it back to Britt. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Great information. We are going to roll into our fourth poll question and our final poll question. Um, before we get started on that, though, I just want to invite everyone. There is a Q&A section. If anyone has questions they're starting to develop, feel free to type those in and get them into the queue for at the end of the presentation, um, and we'll address those uh, uh, address as many as we can within the time frame that we've got available. But your poll question number four is what percentage of your total treatment volume is from INI or infiltration and inflow? So please select one of the following, 0 to 10, 10 to 25, 25 to 50, or 50 plus. Give that a few minutes for every, or a few seconds, sorry, a little bit of time for everyone to address that, answer that question. As Chris pointed out, we're we're here talking about sanitary sewer systems, but there's definitely a myriad of other applications where grouts are used. Basically, anywhere grout or water is a nuisance, uh, grout can be used to control that groundwater. All right, our poll results for what percentage of your total treatment volume is for I and I? Um, 10 to 25 percent looks like that was our biggest response at 43 percent of the attendees. 36 percent um, responded with uh, 25 to 50. Over 50 was 11%, as well as 0 to 10, 11%. Those were tied. Interesting information. Um, all right. We're going to hand back the baton to Mr. Jake Swanson. He's going to carry us out this last little bit, and then I'll finish this out in the last five or six slides, and we'll jump into the Q&A section. Jake, take it away if you would, please. Thank you for jumping back on. Great. Thank you, Britt. Uh, perhaps. Uh, slight trick question there because every system is going to be a little bit different but um, great answers given the EPA actually estimates that 50% of the treatment volume at our wastewater treatment plants is a result of I and I inflow and infiltration so it's clean water that shouldn't be getting treated if we could get it out of there we'd be saving a lot of money I live in Minnesota as I might have mentioned before and Metropolitan or our Met Council did a, or a study back in 2013, and they estimated just the Twin Cities metro area, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and surrounding urban area, uh, just in that zone, INI was costing ratepayers over $500 million a year. So to put a number to it and how costly just this additional water can be, uh, I hope that helps kind of put it in, per, into perspective. Now, we are the land of 10,000 10, lakes. We have a lot of water here, but that's not much different from anywhere else, especially being the EPA has pointed out on this slide. It says 50% of all treatment, or 50% of the water at all treatment plants is I and I. So why do we want to control infl inflow and infiltration? Kind of the basics is we want to meet federal and state regulations, especially if we're under consent decree. We want to prevent sanitary sewer overflows. We want to reduce cost and operation costs as well as maintenance for our municipality within the collection system. We want to avoid those man-made sinkholes like we saw before. The majority of sinkholes that we come across are actually man-made and from below grade infrastructure. We also have situations where we have karst soils depending on uh, where in the world you are that can lead to natural forming sinkholes. But most commonly they're going to be man-made from below grade infrastructure about our collection systems are meant to move solids pretty quickly and efficiently so once soils can get in they're going to get moved quickly and efficiently as well additionally maybe most importantly we want to protect our environment and promote healthy communities 
This is a quick little cost analysis to also help put in perspective how much water can cost us and how even when we look at some of these leaks or some of these different situations, it may seem small, but in the grand scheme of things, it adds up quickly. So if we assume a leaking manhole is active 24-7, meaning it's in the groundwater table, we're seeing that leak all the time. If that one manhole has a five gallon per minute leak, that's contributing over two and a half million gallons of water per year. A lot of you are likely at home right now, so take a look at your bathtub. If you have a standard bathtub, that quantity right there, 2.6 million gallons, is like filling that bathtub 33,000 times. A lot of water from a five gallon per minute leak within one manhole. If we take that same idea and we scale it up, how many municipalities have 10 manholes? Every single one. What if 10 of those manholes had that five gallon per minute leak? Now we're up to 26 million gallons. And when we look at the national average treatment cost, which is just slightly over $3 per thousand gallons of water treated, we come up with a number that's roughly $80,000 just to treat that water in 10 manholes. Now the average cost to seal a precast manhole structure using injection grouting, roughly $1,300. This varies a little bit depending on your region, where you're located, what contractors are in the area. But overall, this seems to be a, a pretty good number from what we've seen nationwide. So hopefully that helps put it into perspective and shows where our ROI can really come from just from grouting manholes, the low-hanging fruit, as Chris pointed out earlier. Pretty big uh, saving that we can see there. Additionally, when we go back and we're looking at the system, if we want to look at preventing sewer failures or what the process of sewer failure looks like. Earlier, we touched on this with infiltration and we talked about loss of fines. But what does that actually look like? We talked about misalignment joint or misalignment in the joints. This is a good depiction. So stage one, that joint, the seal has failed, whether that's a rubber gasket or if that oakum and lead, oakum and tar, whatever may have been used depending on when the system was installed, it has failed, allowing just water to come in. Over time, that's going to continue to deteriorate, going to start letting those fines come in. Now we're losing the supporting soils because soils are starting to enter. We move to stage two. We see now... We're starting to see some of that misalignment it may not be bad enough to where we have any structural damage. Hopefully this is where we can get to it. We can stop that infiltration. We can stabilize those soils with the grout, which is also unlike any other technology. Grout, because it's flowing outside of the collection system, stabilizes the soils. Everything else is done within the pipe. So with that, Stabilizing the pipe prevents that misalignment point loading on the joints, which oftentimes develops those structural deficiencies or the cracks that we see in the crown or near the joints, which would be stage three, where we'd be looking at hopefully still a trenchless technology, but we might have to look at dig and replace or more expensive rehabilitation technologies. So what does that actually look like in real life? Animations are great for showing the process, showing the idea, especially when it's below grade. This is what it actually looks like. These, this, these are pictures from a test cell that was meticulously put together, all the soils compacted, because we wanted to get a better understanding and a better feel for how the grout actually performs, how it's flowing through defects and joints. Performed multiple times, this isn't just a single joint. And each time, depending on the soils, uh, we wound up with, in the top left, if you see, it looks like a bell. So that's a donut around that whole pipe joint of grouted, stabilized soil. So water can't pass through that soil anymore. And that bell shape, you can see it almost cradles that pipe, holding it up from the bottom, acting almost like a footing to your house. That's going to stabilize that pipe and prevent it from future movement extending the life cycle of that pipe because we're not going to wind up with those structural deficiencies. Hopefully this helps tell the story of grouting a little bit more. With that, I'm going to turn this back over to Britt Babcock. 
He's going to continue uh, with a bit more information. All right. Thank you, Jake. <coughs> Excuse me. How do we get the confidence in knowing that grouting <coughs> is a successful um, uh, <coughs> successful application and technology? Well, there's several things that we need to have to have that happen, right? We need to have standards or controls in place. Um, we need to have competency in our technicians and our applicators. So we, in order to get that, or if we have those two things, that'll give us consistent, reliable results, which gives us confidence that uh, the design community can go out and design this. We know that the applicators are going to install it correctly. And uh, by following those guidelines and controls or standards, that gives us great success. So, um, you know, we've, the following factors must be must be present, right? We have to have those controls. We must have the applicators. Uh, and then we'll get those results. With all those factors in place, we know we can confidently uh, specify and implement injection grouting as a very reliable, viable repair methodology. Now, grouting has been around for 40, 50 years now using um, AV100 acrylamide grout for controlling groundwater and then uh, into I and I collection systems, as well as for round mantles um, and the urethane grouts that are used for that as well. So, what standards do we have to uh, add our ready um, to, to use in our toolbox? Um, the first is uh, there's a white paper that's put out by ICGA, the Infiltration Control Grouting. At the time, association, it's now called the Infiltration Control Grouting Committee. Um, it's a part of NASCO, which is the National Association of Sanitary Services Companies. And uh, its white paper is the role of chemical grouting in wastewater systems. Definitely welcome everyone to visit NASCO's website to kind of capture a copy of that and read it. Uh, a tremendous amount of great information. It helps create the standards of which we can follow, and we do follow as an industry. Uh, to complement that, um, many of the specifiers out there today are following NASCO's suggested standard specification for, for grouting. Its, its title is Pressure Testing and Grouting of Sewer Pipe Joints, Laterals, and Lateral Connections using the path, Packer method with solution routes. Now this was a group of many of the industry experts out there and contractors and designers and material suppliers that all gathered together and built this specification for the industry to follow to create that standard. So those standards and specifications exist out there to help create that control. Um, what about longevity of acrylamide grout? One of the common misbeliefs is, is that it's a short-term solution. The reality is, is the grout is not the driving factor, it's how it's applied. Um, the grout has been shown and proven through laboratory testing that it has longevity. Uh, this happens to be a study that was done, it was a 20 year study on grouts by the Department of Energy on acrylamide grout um, from the mid 80s to the uh, mid 2000s before they encapsulated hazardous waste with acrylamide grout. They actually studied it and came up with a half-life of 362 years. Now, don't be deceived. That was based on a 20% grout concentration. So when we consider that to be a half-life, we back that back down at the proper grout concentrations and we use mathematical calculations. Um, at a 12%, you can estimate a 50-year design life on that same material, 12% grout concentration. So um, there has been studies out there uh, another study that Avanti has, has uh, helped foster was one of the common misbeliefs was that the grout shrinks. Now, if I were to mix grout in front of you, some of the AV100 acrylamide grout in a cup, and we let it set overnight in that cup outside in open air, yes, it's going to evaporate some, some ground, some water. It'll evaporate water from within the sample. However, one of the things that we've always known for many, many decades within Avanti was the grout doesn't shrink when it underground, but we hadn't proven that scientifically. Well, about four years ago, Avanti said, we're gonna prove it. So what we did is we undertook a study, third party independent study by Dr. Doug Cobos, um, Mr. PhD there. Uh, and what he did was uh, took a measure of re relative humidity. We had a belief that the relative humidity was extremely high underground. And so they actually buried sensors in the ground down to 20, down to 14 feet. 
uh, in a test boring um, and measured that relative humidity. The, the sensors were backfilled with soil, uh, the native soil. And what you'll see is this boring was actually put in uh, or the test samples were put in a very arid, arid climate in Riverside, California. Now, Riverside, California, believe it or not, is one of the driest cities in the country. Uh, I personally didn't believe it at first, and I even checked on a few other cities, talked to some other colleagues of mine back in my engineering days, and uh, they were right. So we dug a hole or drilled a hole down 20 feet, set sensors at various depths, 2, 4, 7, and 14, 10, and 14 feet, uh, backfilled those sensors with soil so that they had intimate contact with the earth. And what we found was um, over the driest period of Riverside, California's dry season, that the relative humidity stayed right at 100% at full depth, right from the surface down. Now, why would that be? Well, think about it. Not necessarily why, but just from an experience perspective, if when I knocked over one of these clods in this dirt field, it was may have been dry and desiccated on the top but it was moist on the bottom. How many of us have had that experience? I bet every one of us on this call has experienced that. So if you think of that phenomenon to have relative humidity from the ground surface down, that's not that unbelievable if we can have moisture right underneath this dirt, dirt clod, right at the surface. So I mentioned that we were during the driest season or rainfall season uh, of the year for Riverside, California, during the months at which we tested, uh, don't be fooled. This is not a big spike in rainfall. It's a whopping 0.4 inches uh, during the entire month of August in 2017. Uh, I apologize, this was three years ago, not four years ago. But just shows the rainfall event that we experienced um, in Riverside, California during the time of testing. It was very, very minimal. And so uh, this reflects our soil relative humidity. So it actually was right at 100%. You'll see we hovered around 105 to 100 but it, it was at 100% for the entire duration. Um, one of the things that now that we've proven the soil was at 100%, we needed to show, or we were curious, how does the grout react in a 100% relative humidity environment? So Dr. Kobos then took samples of NEAT AV100 grout and exposed it to um, a 100% humidity environment for 12 weeks. And we had negligible water loss. I mean, it was almost immeasurable at 0.03%. I mean, we're talking 0.0003. So basically what we've concluded is uh, the grout does not shrink. We have relative humidity up to uh, at 100% in the ground. And then showing that the AV100, when tested in that 100% humidity situation, will not dehydrate or shrink. So We've, we've now scientifically proven why AV100 does not shrink underground. Uh, Dr. Kobos has a great quote here I want to point out. It's based on the thermodynamic analysis, field testing, and laboratory testing. AV100 chemical grout installed below the shallow surface layer will not shrink from desiccation. Uh, and that's exactly what that study uh, was found to be. So that should give you confidence in that uh, the grout does sustain its uh, shape, volume, uh, and capacity while uh, serving as a water stop situation. Now we'll step into the Q and A section uh, of the presentation. We are uh, we've got 10 minutes left, so um, any questions that anyone might have, please jump into the Q and A section. Throw them into the queue. We've got several in here already. Uh, let me pick from one or two here. Um, well, one of them we've already answered, which was what is the design life of the grout by itself? Well, we've talked about that, right? At a 12% grout concentration, which is where we're seeing the industry move to, uh, historically it's been at 10%, but at 12%, it's a 50 year design life. And we can show that mathematically when we back calculate to the Corps of Engineers, 20% uh, grout calculations. Um, another question is, is there an ideal time of the year to grout? Uh, you know, they grout year round, whether it's in the southern states of Florida, Georgia, uh, Virginia's, or I mean, of, of the Carolinas, um, and they also grout in the northern states as well year-round. Um, a lot of times in the northern states, those sanitary sewer systems or collection systems are well below frost line, so it's really a non-issue. They can access that. You're you're below freeze line, so you're installing grout uh, 
in a normal soil condition. So it does happen year round. Um, another question is, is what does the pipe look like after it is grouted? Well, really, there's not much to see from a grout perspective from inside. A lot of the grout, I mean, all of the grout, when injected into a joint or a defect, actually goes on the outside of the pipe to create that soil gel matrix. And uh, much like Jake spoke about, much like Chris spoke about, um, so you can't see where the grout is actually doing its work. It's outside of the pipe, intermixed with the soil and sealing off that defect. Uh, Jake, do you want to take this one? How do you prevent unintended damage to the existing pipe from grouting pressures or from setting the packers if material is missing from around the outside of the pipe? How do you prevent <clears throat> unintended damage to the existing pipe, either from grouting pressures or if you're miss if you have voids, basically if you have voids missing from around outside outside of the pipe? Yeah, well, so um, you take that one? one one of the Oh, go ahead. Jay. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take it. You, you you can add in a little bit if I uh, if if you think I yeah, miss on something. But one 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 of the key characteristics of the grout that's used in main lines and laterals or the AV100 grout is it's the same viscosity as water. Um, all of the pressures as it's being injected, those pressures are monitored so that in the packer. I may have uh, missed mentioning this. It has a small sensor or a transducer that relays what that grouting pressure is back to the technician that's sitting in the truck. So they actually can monitor what their injection pressures are and make sure that they're staying low enough to where they're not going to damage that pipe. Um, with the viscosity being the same as water, it's gonna flow out into the soils the same way that groundwater would. And typically, these uh, our sewer system, are gonna be bedded in soils that are rather permeable, whether that's rock or crushed, crushed gravel or uh, sand, depending on the construction time and what was performed. So the path of least resistance is actually into the soils instead of building up to that pipe. Anything else you think should be added there, Chris? That's, that's perfect. One of the things, Chris, could you allude to uh, the second half of that question, which was talking about how the packer doesn't allow can the packer damage the pipe or how do they avoid that from happening? What does the app or applicator or technician do to avoid that from happening? Right, so, so and that is, that's a very good technical question. Um, the, when the, when the uh, remote packer is inflated, um, and I, I know that that question is probably mostly geared towards vitrified clay pipe um, because we all know that the clay is a little bit fragile in some ways. Um, but they're only going to inflate the bladder just enough to overcome the head pressure of incoming groundwater infiltration. So in other words, if we had a pipe that, uh, let's just say hypothetically, it's at 10 feet um, below ground surface, we know we're going to have an, an infiltration head pressure of around 5 PSI. So they're only going to inflate those bladders up to 8 PSI maximum, maybe 9. Um, and, and like Jake mentioned just a moment ago, when they're introducing the AV100 acrylamide grout, um, what they're doing is they're essentially using positive displacement. So if you've got groundwater infiltrating at 5 PSI roughly, um, then they're going to inject that grout at around 6 or 7 PSI. Now that's important because there's three things happening. Number one, you're overcoming the head pressure of the incoming groundwater, so that's positive displacement. Number two, you're still basically pushing the material out. So again, through positive displacement, you're pushing it out into the soil. That's what Britt and Jake were talking about, the gel soil matrix that happens on the outside of the pipe. The third thing is by keeping the, uh, the pumping pressures at around seven PSI, give or take, just enough to overcome the head pressure, the infiltration, you're also not getting what they call blow by, which means that uh, if you pumped at too high a pressure and it was higher pressure than what your bladders are inflated at, then you would get material just blowing by your bladders. Um, so that's essentially, it's it, you know, it's a good question about how to prevent damage and this is how it's done. Um, minimal pressures, low viscosity resins, and 
and that is the way you mitigate those pressures and prevent damage to pipe of any kind. Great response, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, all right, here's another question. Uh, Jake, I'll let you tackle this one. Grouting is viewed by many as a temporary fix, and I know we addressed some of this in the presentation, but let's, re let's reiterate it. How long will grout last, and what can be done before and during a project to make sure the process is a long-term fix? Let me, let me mention it again. Grouting is viewed by many as a temporary fix. How long will grout last, and what can be done before and during the project to make sure the process is a long-term fix? A lot, to, a lot to break down in that question. Um, kind of unique. Uh, so, as Brent, Britt has mentioned before, the 12% grout concentration, which the industry is really moving towards from the historic 10%, um, gives us that 50-year design criteria within the grout. However, it is still most important with the grouting that it has to be applied correctly. No matter what construction process we look at, it is always about set up, set up, set up, preparation, preparation. The product is gonna perform as long as we go through that setup and the preparation correctly. So knowing that when we get in onto the site or even beforehand, when we're in the planning and the development phase, we wanna take into consideration uh, what types of soils were used. If we can determine that from a construction standpoint, it helps us in developing how much material is gonna be required. Now, if you look at NASCO as well as Avanti, we have uh, pretty similar standards as to the amount of grout that should be injected per inch diameter of that pipe. So NASCO specifications says between a quarter and half a gallon of grout per inch diameter, where Avanti is a, a little bit more conservative and we bump that up to between a third and half a gallon per inch diameter of pipe. That gives us a good comfortable number to where we can calculate in the soil how large that grout ring is going to become. And we never know if there's additional voids that have been caused from those loss of fines. So that's where the air pressure test comes in. If we pump grout and then we perform an air pressure test and we still have air pressure that's bleeding off, an additional or subsequent grouting uh, or subsequent grout quantity would be pumped, typically double or I mean the, the same quantity that, which was first pumped. So if we're an eight inch line and we pumped four gallons the first time, that air pressure test failed, we'd pump another four gallons, perform another air pressure test. That would continue depending on how the specification reads for another time or continue to stage grout until we can pass that air pressure test. So it's really between the testing and the specifications helps bring us to the point where we can have confidence that uh, we have a good seal on that pipe. All right, thank you, Jake. I think we have time for one more question. Um, Chris, I'll let you tackle this one. We mentioned in the presentation, um, or you mentioned in the presentation, we as an Avanti, uh, how CIPP and grout complement each other as opposed to compete with each other. Can you explain that? In a little Absolutely. more detail. That was the question. Yep. And this will wrap that, that up is, this question. This is our last question. So take 60 seconds and answer that if you would, Chris, please. Okay. I'll, uh, <laughs> that is a good question. So um, if you're familiar at all with CIPP liners, whether steam cured or UV cured, you know that groundwater infiltration um, is a problem. And uh, how many lining companies, contractors, utilities have had to go back and redo liners because they tried to. Uh, put their liners in and cure out in the presence of active infiltration. So you get bellies in the liner, you get defects in the liner, and then uh, unfortunately you have to go back and cut them out and redo them. So for instance, in those settings, it is it is good practice. It's just, it's, it's, uh, it's prudent to grout and eliminate the active infiltration before you try to place a liner. Um, the, uh, another scenario is with liners, uh, Jake may have mentioned this earlier or not, I'm not sure, but contrary to what some people believe, a CIPP liner does not bond to the inside of the hose pipe. So once it's placed, inverted, and cured out, um, you're going to have an annulus. And, and in those cases, water, groundwater infiltration 
can still travel into the lateral connection and travel down this annulus. So you still end up in a position where you have very little reduction, if any, in flow. Grouting can be used because it's the same viscosity as water to fill that annulus, seal it off from infiltration. And, and that's just a few very obvious examples, but there are so many more where CIPP and grouting work well together. Perfect. Perfect answer. Thank you, Chris, for that. With that, we'll close up our Q&A section. We're right at 3 o'clock. I need to wrap this up. Be respectful for everyone's time on the call. So grateful that everybody joined us today. Thank you for that. One of the things we like to do at Avanti is we like to continue the educational efforts and continue to lead the way through, um, through education. And as part of that, there are three promise documents that we're going to provide to each one of the attendees on the call. The first one is the white paper on zero shrinkage of AV100 chemical grout due to relative humidity uh, by, Dr. Doc, by Dr. Doug Cabos, excuse me. Um, and then there's also a document on sewer grouting, main lines, laterals, and lateral connections, and the grouting of manhole rehabilitation. So look for that in your inboxes. You'll, everyone on the call will receive an electronic copy of those. Um, with that, we'd like to say thank you to everyone on the call. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Chris, give me a 10 second snapshot as a closing statement. Sure, uh, like Britt said, thank you for taking time to do this. We appreciate you being here. Um, no matter what part of the industry you're in, whether utility, contractor, engineer, uh, reach out. When you have questions, when you get back into a corner with technical issues, uh, just give us a call and know that you have, you have assistance at your fingertips. Thanks. Amen, perfect. Jake. Closing statement for you, sir. I think I just want to reinforce what Chris said. Reach out. We're just a call away. Our uh, collection systems and the defects and the challenges that we come across are always unique and always changing. So reach out. Oftentimes we've seen it. Additionally, uh, a lot of the information that we covered here and more is available on our website. So always feel free to take a look at that for different videos and animations that couldn't be used in the presentation and additional assistance. And thank you. All right. Thank you, Jake. Last but not least, I want to give credit and recognize Miss Jessica Williams. Some of you on the call may be uh, friends with her. You may, be, uh, you may know of her, but she is the one that's quarterbacked this for us. Um, Jessica does a fantastic job as our marketing manager on the Avanti team. And uh, thank you, Jessica, for that. Uh, I'm Britt Babcock, president of Avanti. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Go out there, be safe, be healthy. Please be socially responsible as we try to get through this tough time in the pandemic. I know we will, and uh, we're all going to be better, stronger for it. So thank you very much.